So I'll now give the word to Jürgen Christensen Dalsgård from the University of Aarhus, who uh, brought helioseismology uh, further and also started on to asteroseismology. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And yes, the slides are up there. So my entry into helioseismology was a little bit indirect. I was working on solar oscillations in a different context, uh, which turned out not to be very re relevant for anything. Uh, and then in the middle of my PhD, uh, we heard about data on, so on global solar oscillations, not oscillations quite near the surface, as Roger talked about, but oscillations involving the whole sun, which were extremely exciting because that would give us a way to probe the whole of the solar interior. The data were crap. They, they were wrong. But, but they inspired us to start looking at the properties of oscillations and how they uh, were related to the interior structure of the Sun. And then, of course, came, the, we had the data from, from uh, Franz Sleiper, and then also came other types of data. So just to remind you what we had uh, in the, from Franz Sleipner and what Rati Ulrich analyzed were waves that were trapped in the outer layers of the Sun. You could use those frequencies to extrapolate towards the solar interior but clearly what we really wanted uh, was data that told us something directly about what happened in the core of the Sun, and in particular in relation to the solar neutrino problem, which was very much an active issue at the time. And, and those data came shortly after uh, I finished my PhD. Observations made by the Birmingham group, now here represented by Ivan Ellsworth, we'll hear more about that later, these very crummy power spectra showing power of oscillation as a function of frequency, but observing the sun as a star, taking all the light from the sun into the instrument and not resolving the surface. And so these are sensitive to the modes that penetrate all the way to the core. And, and together with my, my former supervisor, Dr. Scoff, we could actually identify these peaks as corresponding to what you would expect from oscillations acoustic oscillations of the whole sun. And then very shortly after that came these marvelous data obtained uh, from five days of continuous observations a few hundred meters from the geographical South Pole. That's a good place to observe the sun because the sun doesn't sit and if the weather operates you can get data over a very long time, uh, time and that is required to resolve the individual frequencies of the oscillations. The frequencies of the, of the sun are always in, in this frequency range around uh, 3 millihertz periods of about 5 minutes. But here we had this very large, very precisely determined set of frequencies. And that really was the start of getting into the sun using these oscillations. The structure is shown here. These again are solar data. Uh, it could be the same data more or less. And we have these peaks that turn out to be almost uniformly spaced. And they come in groups uh, where characterized by a large frequency separation like this. And that large frequency separation, I won't have many equations here. Equations are wonderful, but maybe not in, in this context. But that large frequency separation is proportional to the square root of the mean density of a star. And that's a very basic measure of acoustic properties of, of uh, a star. And then we can also measure now the location and frequency of the maximum power. And that also depends on the mass and radius. It depends on the surface gravity of the star. So from these measurements, we get two measures of mass and radius. And we can actually, from that, determine the mass and radius of the star. That's boring for the sun. We know the mass and radius of the sun. But it's not boring for our stars. And we'll get back to that later. Then there's also fine structure in this, uh, and we can see that if we blow the spectrum up. Again, frequency, power. And we see that we have pairs of peaks separated by what we call the small frequency separation, a little delta nu, and again, an equation. But what matters is that this is sensitive to the structure of the core of the star. And so that provides a measure of the age of the star, how much hydrogen has been turned into helium. But it also provides a measure of the conditions of the region where neutrinos are formed. And so just as uh, Roger mentioned, to get back to the neutrino uh, studies, uh, 
We had this problem that the neutrinos generated in the sun were detected by Ray Davis. He got the Nobel Prize for that. But the number he got out was uh, much lower than the, what the models predicted, even at that time. And so the question again was whether the models were incorrect, which could very easily be the case. Modeling stars is, after all, a complex business. Or whether there was something interesting going on with the neutrinos. And what uh, Yvonne did, using the data for the whole sun, the modes that penetrate all the way to the core, was to point out that if you tried to take, make models that fitted the neutrino data, they were inconsistent with these helioseismology measurements of these modes that penetrated all the way to the core. Whereas normal models with a high neutrino flux were more or less in agreement with the observations. And that was a very strong indication uh, at that time, in, in, in uh, the, around 1990, that the issue was not with the solar models, it was really with our understanding of the neutrinos. And that realization, uh, as I'm sure you know, led to a Nobel Prize about 10 years later when we discovered the neutrino oscillations observationally and found out that there were three types of neutrinos and we only at that time, we were sensitive to uh, one, one of these types. And some of us felt that maybe this early realization should have been included in that Nobel Prize, but, well, you know, that's the way things go. So, um, we, we, we are here, we are happy. So. <laughs> now, the second thing, and this will become important later, you, can, you have this fine structure of the oscillations, and one interesting way to analyze that is to say that, okay, we have this uniform spacing of peaks. So let's try to illustrate that by cutting up this spectrum in bits with a length of this delta nu, the spacing between the peaks, and then stack these uh, bits. And what we get out of that is what is called an initial diagram, where you see that the modes we, with frequency here uh, for, uh, form vertical stripes, more or less, according to where they are in these bits of frequency spe uh, spectrum. And in that, you very clearly see this small frequency separation between modes of degree L equal to 0 and 2, and 1 and 3, and then repeating 0 and 2 here. So you get a very clean uh, illustration of the properties of the oscillation spectrum. Which is a bit boring, but I mean, that's nice, we can analyze it, and the structure to that, which is also interesting, I won't have time to talk about that. So all this was fun, but at that point we, we had two classes of modes. We had modes trapped very close to the surface, and we had modes going all the way to the center. We didn't know anything about what was going on in between. And so it was a major breakthrough when Duval and Harvey analyzed Again, a diagram that looks like what Roger showed us, but this goes from circular harmonic degree zero, the modes that penetrate all the way to the center, to a modest spherical harmonic, so modes that are trapped out here. We could connect the two regions, and we could identify the modes uniquely, and then we could start doing a detailed analysis to determine the sound speeds in the solar interior from the observations. And this is what is shown here. We have a model of the sun, the dashed line, and then the solid curve shows the inferred, just from the observations, no model involved, the inferred sound speed, squared sound speed in, in the solar interior. And at least in this part, everything works fine. In here, the technique becomes a little bit crummy, but we could carry on the analysis and find the difference in the square sound speed between the sun and the model showing that there were, that there's some uncertainty in indicated here, there were some issues with the model in the deeper part of the, of the sun. The models were good, but they were not perfect. And clearly, to move beyond, uh, beyond this, we need better data. And th that's where the work by Roger and, and many others to develop space observations of solar oscillations, but also big ground-based campaigns of solar oscillations became very important. Here I'm, I'm going to use data from the Suhu spacecraft that Roger mentioned already, uh, but we also have the ground-based Gong network, which is also still operating. Suhu is still working after very many years. It was launched in, in 1995. 
So Roger already showed this diagram showing the power of the oscillation as a function of the degree, similar to what uh, Duval and Harvey observed, but with very, very much higher precision and accuracy. And we can see that if we extract the frequencies of the modes from these uh, radius, so here uh, is plotted frequencies of the oscillations, with error bars being good observers, we have to indicate the error bars, but these error bars are 1,000 sigma error bars. So we know these frequencies of oscillations better than we know the mass of the Sun, because the determination of the mass of the Sun is limited by the determination of the gravitational constants. And then again, as Roger did, we can take a solar model. This, this happens to be uh, my famous solar model S. Somebody thought I should buy a Tesla model S for my price. <laughs> my wife didn't agree, so uh, that's where we are. Uh, and, and you see, uh, again, I mean, here you would say things look pretty good. The model agrees pretty well with the observations. But of course, we're talking about 1,000 sigma error bars. So what we need to do is then to take the difference between the observed frequencies and the model frequencies. And then we can carry out this analysis that Roger mentioned, the inverse analysis, to go from the differences in frequency to the differences between the sound speed in the sun and the model. Uh, and, and this uh, is, again, the difference between the sun and this model S. And you would say that we are not doing too badly. This is the square of the sound speed difference. And the, the model agrees with the sun to within a few parts in a thousand. Which some people might think is quite a good model. I mean, I'm, I'm fairly proud of it. And of course, the wonderful thing is that we can say physics we know from the Earth. Apply it to treat, describe the interior of the star, and that gets something out that looks so closely like the star. But then you look at error bars. Again, we're, we're good observers, and you can't see them. So in that sense, it's really a very crummy, bad model. Uh, we can see that it agrees with the uh, sun very well in the core, and then, of course, that's consistent with the neutrino problem being not a problem of the model, as Roger mentioned. But also, what has happened since then is that the model has become a lot worse. We have new measurements of the surface composition of the sun, that changes the opacity and therefore changes the structure of the model. And, and so while this was the model I showed before that I kind of liked back in, in the uh, mid-1990s, uh, a more recent model with a more recent dissemination of the solar surface composition shows a much bigger difference between the Sun and the model. So we are far from done yet with probing the solar interior. We don't know what's wrong. We, we sort of guess that it might have something to do with the opacity, the measure of the interaction between the uh, uh, sun, radiation and, and matter in the, in the sun, but uh, this is something we're working very hard on still. So even though uh, I retired, it's still not time to take up golf. Uh, we have also uh, used these data to get very good measurements of the solar interiorization, again measurements from the uh, SOHO satellite, here is shown the rotation uh, frequency uh, going from 450 nanohertz to uh, 300 nanohertz. We see the variation at the surface that we also see directly. And we see that that penetrates through the outer parts of the sun in, in the convection zone, going into what, with also with better data, seems to be almost uniform rotation in the solar area. And we don't understand how that came about from what was presumably a rapidly rotating initial solar structure. The sun has lost angular momentum through the solar wind, but how that has ended up giving us this variation in rotation, we don't really understand why we have this sharp transition at the base of the convection zone, which is very likely closely related to the generation of the solar magnetic field. So these are issues that are also have some substantial importance to the so kind of solar physics that people are working on here in Oslo, the understanding solar activity, how it varies in the, with the 11-year cycle. So th this is all very good. That's the sun. It's a very simple star. We have learned a lot about it. We still don't understand it, but of course there are many other stars, and so we really... It has been a goal, even since we first saw the solar oscillations, to move to other stars. <laughs> 
the, the most exciting is essentially by the convective light field mechanism that excites noise that then resonates with the normal modes of the star. And we accept, expect to have that noise in all stars without a convection zone. So that means all stars at a solar temperature and cooler. So where are they? And the, the issue there is that the amplitudes are so very small. Uh, up to maybe a meter per second in radio velocity, maybe a few parts per million in intensity. So to see these oscillations was a big challenge. And the first success in doing that to the level where you could resolve peaks we claimed was in this observation by Hans Kelsen and colleagues uh, in, in the mid-90s of a star, Eta Brutis. Uh, I, I love it, uh, Andrew, when you talk about where stars are in the sky. This star is not very far from the brightest star in the north sky, Arcturus. You can see it with the naked eye. And Hans and, and colleagues observed it and found these frequency spectrum and were able to identify the peaks in the spectrum. And we could make an the shell diagram again. You remember the shell diagram of the sun where you had just these vertical lines? We see them here for L equal to 0 and 2. And then we have something pretty messy here. And that mess is extremely interesting because that is caused by the fact that this is not a, quite a solar-like star. It's about a one solar mass star, but it's an old star. And we all know that older stars and older people become more and more interesting the older they get. <laughs> and in this case, the, the star has a fairly highly condensed helium core. And that causes oscillations with, uh, a di of a different kind, what we call mixed modes. And that is what causes these deviations in the, uh, in the cell diagram. The bending of the curves, you see that in the observations, you see it, of course, clearly in the, in the model. And this we can use then to study the pro internal properties of the, of, the, uh, of the star. Now, to move on, again, we needed more data. We like, would love to have data from space. And fortunately, NASA launched the Kepler satellites, uh, my, my group has been strongly involved in using and organizing the use of Kepler data for astro seismology, and we have data covering the whole HR diagram. Connie, who likes it hot, I have to say that, focuses on the, on the hot side of the HR diagram, and we uh, have focused on the cooler stars. And there have been very many, very interesting analyses uh, carried on. One very interesting aspect is to study stars that host exoplanets and find their properties. But what I want to do here is to end by talking about red giant stars, and where we have seen very fascinating results. And there we see very strongly this mixed character of the modes, the acoustic modes in the outer parts of the star, and the internal gravity waves in the core of the star, coupling together in a way that directly affects the observed frequencies. So if we go back to look at what we looked at before, namely power as a function of frequency for one of these red giant stars, we see superficially what we saw before. We have pairs of peaks, L equals to zero and two here, L equals to zero and two here, L equals to zero and two here. And then we would expect a single, we can't see L equals to three with these data, but we would ex expect a single peak corresponding to L equals to one between these two pairs. We see three peaks, if we don't look too carefully. So something is going on, and what is going on is that we have this coupling between the gravity wave character and the acoustic mode character, causing that we see many more modes in the star than we would expect just acoustically. And so we can measure, well, we can measure, of course, the uh, spacing between these peaks as we did before. We can also measure the characteristics of this signature that we see here, and here, and here. And then we can make a diagram. It was first made by Tim Betting, but here I'm showing a version made by the, uh, Benoit Messier from Paris, where we have the acoustic mode signature on the one axis and the gravity mode signature on the other axis. And then we have a whole bunch of stars. Uh, and down here we have stars that are burning the red giants. They have a helium core. They are burning hydrogen in a shell around the core. And up here we have stars that still have the helium core, but here helium has ignited in the center of the core. 
And we can make a very clear distinction between these two sets of stars that superficially look pretty much exactly the same. And so we can begin to study the processes of the helium burning in the core of these highly evolved stars. And we, we have thousands of these stars now observed and, and studied in, in this manner. We can also, as I mentioned before, we can measure the mass and the radius of the star, and so we can color code the stars with mass, and we see that there's a group of lower mass star in this helium core burning phase, and then more massive stars moving down towards the uh, lower measures of this uh, gravity characteristic. And we can also measure, and we did that for, uh, showed that for the sun, measure the rotation rates of the stellar interior. And we do that by looking at the hyperfine structure, if you like, of these peaks. You, if you look carefully, you can see that these are actually splits. This is blown up here. And that splitting is a measure of how far it's mainly the core rotates. And so we can measure the core rotation rates of these stars and again, we can do that in, in the diagram. Here we are using the radius of the star and the rotation uh, frequency of the core. And we see that these red giant stars that are burning hydrogen in a shell around the helium core lie up here. They are rotating. Um, who knows what, what rapid rotation is? But if you think about a star evolving and the helium core contracting very, very strongly, to something that's maybe not much bigger than the Earth. You might expect that this helium core would be spinning like crazy. And it's spinning fairly rapidly. It's spinning more or less with the speed of the sun, but much, much more slowly than our models would predict. And so here we have another mystery in stellar evolution. Why is it that the cores of these stars are spinning so much more slowly than we would predict from our models? And then as the star move on to the phase where they have uh, helium burning in the core, we see that the core rotation rate then also decreases. And, and so we can actually follow the evolution of, of stellar rotation from the main sequence all the way to this late phases. And then we can move on and study uh, white dwarfs, which is basically that core after the ends its burning of, of, hydrogen, of, of helium. And we can then also see the rotation using astro-seismology of these white dwarf stars. And then just to finish with a very recent result, because we had, this, we had this splitting that showed us the rotation. And from rotation, we would expect that splitting to be symmetric. But very recently, there have been observations of this splitting in also radian stars, where we see an asymmetry these three modes, we would expect uh, m equals to zero peak to be right in the middle between these two, m equals plus minus one peaks, and they are not. And that splitting almost certainly is a result of the magnetic field in the core of the star. And so from these data, uh, Gang Li and his collaborators were able to estimate a magnetic field of around 100 kilogauss in the core, it turns out that this, this measurement is sensitive mainly to a region where, hydrogen, uh, where in the hydrogen burning shell, and that has to do with the geometry of the modes and how they sense the magnetic field. But one would expect that this would be then be a characteristic magnetic field of the uh, helium core of this star. So then we have this added mystery of how do the is the field generated? Is this a leftover magnetic field from when the star was in the main sequence that has then been preserved through stellar evolution all the way up to this phase of evolution? So uh, we have learned a lot about stars, and we have learned how much we don't understand about stellar interiors. Even those, well, you would say, fairly boring, cool stars, I, think they, I do think they are really cool. Uh, but we definitely have much more work to do in, in this area. And, of course, as always, we need more data. We have data from the test satellite launched in 2018. We are going to get data from the ESA-PLATO mission launched later in this decade. We are trying to set up a network of ground-based observatories to do this. And it's also clear that our understanding of stellar evolution is still very rudimentary, and we need to work very hard to try to understand this better. And I'm sure Connie is going to make the situation even a lot worse than it is now. So thank you very much. <laughs>